Welcome to the Notes to My Legal Self, AI Insights, where law and AI collide. Get ready to level up your legal game with us. We've got career advice, cutting-edge developments, mind-blowing legal tech, and more. Know someone making waves in the legal AI world? Nominate them, or even nominate yourself. We love courageous souls. And don't forget, we want to hear from you, too. Ask questions, drop comments, and let's build a community of legal superheroes. But here's the deal. We're all about to have a blast. AI may be serious, but we're here to make it fun. So buckle up, get ready to power up, and let's embark on this exciting journey together. Now, let's introduce your fearless host, Olga Mack. Get ready to dive into the awesomeness of Notes to My Legal Self, AI Insights. Let's go. Um, this is new. We are going to be talking about an AI. I've had so many conversations about AI in the last few months that I decided that it makes only a lot of sense to continue this conversation live uh, with many folks that I have conversations in private. So we're going to have serious and some of the serious will just have me up here talk about things that I care, that I see community care about. And then there will be episodes like today where I will have fantastic guests who we'll have some deep thoughts and experiences and points of view that I think this community can benefit from and be part of the conversation. So without further ado, Eileen, welcome to Notes in My Lego Cell. I yeah. was dancing to the intro there. It's got a very pleasant tune. It's yeah. Nice, nice word. I would have to. Number one person to entertain is yourself. If you fail to do that, you don't have a chance to entertain others. So start with you and then the rest of the world may follow. I have a thing with this too, and it, 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 it does please me. Yeah, it's totally oh, therapeutic. And there's the ticking time bomb, right? Which is like very nerve wracking, but then you've got the tune to balance it out. So it's good. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> the subtle messages from the universe. Introduce yourself. What are you doing today? Yeah, so today, as of right now, I'm doing this particular webinar. But in general, uh, my my focus today and in the last, I don't know, bunch of years, you could say, has been very much heavily focused on first and primarily legal innovation, right? So bringing new and emerging technologies into the legal domain, but then also more recently, really heavily focused on legislative transformation for emerging technologies with a heavy focus on specifically AI and AI governance and the trends in the sector. And most, re most recently, having led the um, data and model ethics group at Thomson Reuters, um, and more recently than that, working with Olga um, and several others on the responsible AI principles. You've probably seen us um, release with um, the MIT Computational Law Report. Um, yeah, that's my quick summary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how we met the, the MIT computational report. And we had some really deep discussions about consent, what it means to consent, how much of a consent is a consent. And, I know and do you consent to consent? <laughs> and do you consent? <laughs> uh, the depth right. of those discussions have been mind blowing and exciting. I never thought I would get into ethics, but I never thought I would get into securities either. Technology really forces me to learn the rest of the law. <laughs> No, the reason why I didn't go to law school. So that's exciting. Just curious, before we dive into the consent and, and we will cover some model rules and where we are today and where technology is and all kinds of stuff. How did you get where you are today? How does one get up in the morning and start thinking uh, about things like ethics and mm. the context of disruptive technologies such as AI? And specifically in your case, uh, in the context of was, you are privileged not to be a lawyer. And so how did one get up in the morning and say, I'm doing this today? <laughs> yeah, that's, there's a long and winding path there. I actually almost did go to law school, by the way. And I should say, I really do truly love the legal domain, obviously. I'm strangely obsessed with it. It's in my blood. And I, I guess the impetus for, I guess you could say technological transformation, that intersection of law in general, and the passion for that and the, the, the drive to work in the domains that cha are really changing and driving those spaces probably began when I was working in a federally funded human trafficking project in and through, dealing with human trafficking in and throughout Canada. And for me, I was incredibly frustrated with 
the pace of change and the pace at which we were getting to keep from domains and just the way in which, I guess you could say government representatives, but also just the way in which systems worked. Um, they felt incredibly broken to me. Um, and I was very, very frustrated with that uh, progress that we were making. Um, and I don't think, by the way, this is anything to do with any particular project. It's just the state of the union when it comes to the way certain systems are set up, right? And the evolution of technology. And for me, that was a huge driver to get into technology sort of full scope in whatever form it would take me. And in terms of legal innovation specifically, I've always wanted to, I've always just had this like driver and passion for driving change in legal systems. I'm like full holistically and that did get initiated when I came across a group called the Legal Hackers. I'm sure there's probably some on this call. And it's just this phenomenal group of a lot of jaded lawyers. Yes. But but also uh, a lot of technology professionals, data scientists and things like that. And that was really the starting point for me to like really start jumping into legal innovation holistically. And then I've just been dedicated to my career ever since. Oh, uh, that's such a great way to start. So I'm going to kick it out with some rule <laughs> because that's what we do in law. We do some rule. Um, we specifically, we'll talk about the model rules and most of us know them well enough because we had to pass the bar and the baby bar that test specifically this stuff. But the, in the nutshell, there are many ethical responsibilities and they are contained in most parts in the ABA model rules that your state has adapted, which mostly it has, likely depending where you are, but by and large applies to most. There's all kinds of stuff there. Rule 101 talks about company representation and, and client communication and rule 1.4. Cool. And then the one thing we're going to talk about is 1.6, informed consent. We'll do deeply into that rule. Uh, because it is a subject of this conversation. And then there's the client property, rule 115. Uh, that includes clients' data. Rule 1.6 talks about confidential information where a lot of consent actually leave. So what you find is that lawyers must communicate to their clients, with their clients. And there's a lot of guardrails in the ABA. There's a, quite a lot of guidance. The rules has a lot of definition, which you have on your screen is actually... Rule one one e defines informed consent, um, and there's also timing element that you must do it promptly. There's also substance element, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. But with rule one point e, you have an actual definition of informed consent. It, 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 it denotes an agreement proposed in the course of conduct that has to be communicated in an adequate way. So the information and explanation about materials and risks and a reasonably available alternatives. It's a pretty good, good definition and definitely a good place to start. And rule comment six to, to this rule, which I personally find very interesting, was Lawrence, it's all about asterisk and comments and notes and side notes. So this is it, folks. This is an example of one comment six to model rule 1.0 talks about what it means for consent to be informed and provides some explanations. It talks about specifically about the facts and circumstances that are applied to the situation. It talks about the material advantages and disadvantages of the proposed actions, and it talks about alternatives. So quite a lot of things. I'm going to Talk about a few more rules over time, but for now, we have enough of a working definition of what it is and, and a few guardrails in terms of timing and substance. And the various duties that lawyers must have, lawyer has in delivering that legal advice. And I guess, well, I, I will point out the last part that I find very interesting is that in determining whether information and explanation provided are reasonably adequate, there is an adequacy requirement that you okay. have to relevant factors include whether the client or other persons is experienced in the legal matters, generally making decisions of this top type and wealth, whether the client or other persons independently are represented by other parties. So basically the facts and circumstances matter. So let's talk about, because lawyers building stuff, increasingly today we have lawyers build stuff. 
which is a little bit different than giving legal advice. We'll get to the legal advice as well. But say we have Lisa, the lawyer, wants to build the AI tool. She has Kat, the client, that, that she is also advising. What must Lisa do? How much she needs to communicate about what she's doing? <laughs> Let's talk about that. Let's talk about where we are today. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so hearing, hearing you read that out again, it reminds me a lot of the way in which we talk about consent in the GDPR, for example, right? And if we look at the direction in which, and I'll get to Lisa, I promise. Uh, <laughs> this is not me. <laughs> what about Lisa? Lisa, yeah. help her out. <laughs> this is not me refraining from responding to poor Lisa's dilemma. But I do find it, it just an interesting thing to look at is the direction in which consent for use of AI, for example, or using AI in the sort of the, the client context, whether it be using client data to train the AI system, or whatever it is, I think it's very useful to look at the way in which AI regulation is headed. And to do that, looking at existing data protection laws and privacy legislation offers quite a lot that we can learn for, learn from and start to prepare for that sort of like graduation from when we're talking about use of data, but also just the use of AI systems in the context of data protection and, and client concerns. And if we look at the GDPR, a lot of the language is the same as the ABA consent must be freely given. And again, this is in the context of specifically with regards to personal usage of personal data, but consent must be freely given. It must be an ongoing choice. The user must have control, right? Consent must be obvious. Request must be prominent and not buried in legal legalese, for example, right? But when we start to, and here's where, where I'll now start to respond to, to Lisa, is it gets incredibly complicated when we start to look at the nuances of how that's actually done in practice. And when we're talking about advising, let's say we're talking about advising AI adoption in a law firm context with Lisa, head of innovation for uh, Miscellaneous LLP, she would... What we want to look at is a, a lot of by design practices. And so what I mean by that is not, first of all, I should say there isn't one answer right now. There isn't like, we're not going to come out the gate and be like, here, Lisa, here's your, your magic prescription for how you should think about building AI. No, absolutely not. But we, what we can start to do is look at existing best practices. And so you hear a lot of things like when you hear about, okay, what does it mean to make sure that consent is not buried in the for example, right, and that it is clear and that it is, there is full control, it's user-friendly, all these things, we might start to think about laws that are starting to push AI, AI adoption in the direction of, for example, avoiding deceptive patterns, right? So you hear about like de deceptive design patterns intended to obtain consent, right? So we want to make sure that we're avoiding things like that. And I think I'll, Olga, I'm sure you probably want to jump in here too. Um, I mean, the, oh, yeah. I think so. Maybe a, a couple of things. You know, where if, if, to extend we're talking about confidential information of a client, there is a rule for that. <laughs> and uh, what you have in front on your screen is one point six that pretty, pretty clearly yeah. tells you that you need informed consent to use confidential information of a client. And then it doesn't matter whether it's publicly available or even given to to you freely or obtained through another source. The uh, A rules actually a little bit even more robust than on some extent than uh, what you have with things like GDPR. In some extent not, but to some extent, yes, because in, in, it is really protecting that relationship. That's what it aims at. So I would say, well, there, the question, should she obtain consent? The answer is easy, yes. <laughs> There's no two ways around it. Now, the question really becomes really hard or somewhat hard. How much should Lisa disclose from Kat or Kathy, whatever I call the client? At what point she needs to explain about what she's going to do, that that may make sense. But at some point, because AI is somewhat new and the general knowledge about AI is not well settled yet, it is a sort of moving target. And, and so the real question, this is where we've had a lot of conversations as we were providing guidance 
Like, how much do you disclose? Like, how basic is basic and how general knowledge can you assume? For example, uh, we don't explain how electricity works in, in our conversations with clients because that's general knowledge. We don't need to get down to that level. Uh, but with AI, because it's so new and there are different types and uh, there are different risks associated with it, at some point, what does it mean to get a meaningful consent? How much knowledge on your client's part is required? That is a difficult part. So I'm just curious, how deeply would you go into, say, you use generative AI? How deeply would you go into how this thing works? Is that enough to say, here is your Wikipedia article? <laughs> go read up. And, or how, how much, how, how, do you, how much of what situation do you think needs to happen at this point in time? That may be a moving target. Actually, I think it, it goes back to, to your beginning statement there too, about, I, I don't know right now that it is actually necessarily the case that, and this is where a lot of the conversation was spinning when we were building the MIT principles as well, is that. It doesn't seem totally clear just yet that client client consent will be absolutely mandatory and required for the use of AI in the context of actually performing legal services, right? And I think it's really useful to look at where AI legislation is headed. And there's a really interesting piece that was released in New York City. So again, state level um, very recently that I think helps to shed a lot of light on the direction of where it's headed. And it's the um, New York City bias audit requirement for HR automated decision-making systems specifically. And so if we start to look at the nuances of those kinds of requirements, it doesn't actually necessitate explicit consent just yet, but it does, it, it does require that prospective candidates entering a hiring pool be notified that their, their data, their information is being processed through an automated decision-making thing. And that doesn't necessarily mean, okay, yes, you are or not going to be hired, but it means that there are automated uh, systems in place making decisions about how you move through that candidate cycle. And so when we think back into the context of legal practice, I would, I would suspect we're going to head in a very similar direction with regards to consent, specifically when there are things with regards to explicit decisions or things where specifically with regards to generative AI, when we think about potential for data leakage, right, that could end up being potentially harmful to the client down the road should sensitive case data be leaked to another client, for example, if the tool is going to be then used with another case, for example. And yeah, I think there's a lot of use in looking at those models of consent and how things might eventually start to play out in the legal space. Yeah, there, we have, there's a lot of conversation in the chat here. Um, oh, are they? I can't see them. <laughs> I, can't, I can't see them at all. Oh no, let me see them. So Tanya uh, is enjoying it. Um, Maria had a few comments. Uh, about, there are quite a few comments around the consent and what it means, whether it should be in, in writing. And actually, let's talk about it because I feel like when we were, there was not a lot of disagreement when we were drafting parts of the MIT document that consent needs to be there. It, it's pretty clear by the ABA rules that the consent must be there. It must be informed. There's a good time to do it, especially when you use it for to share confidential information and all of that stuff. The question is, does it need to be in writing? And then more specifically, how much do you write? And then there seems to be convergence that yes, you do need to put it in your engagement letter, which is a document where a lot of things leave. And the written documents, just generally speaking, provide pretty good evidence of that disclosures happened and conversations happen, right? There's a reason people put things in writing. Because that's some really good evidence that conversations have happened and you've thought about it and things have been disclosed to you. But then this is where we had a wild debate. And we so, got to no exclusions. <laughs> this is where, like, how much do you put in your engagement letter? Even if the most detail is pretty generic. And historically, they don't have very few specific things. I may or may not use an AI. And then this is how I'm going to input it up. Like, that's usually a little too detailed. But we are in a point of time where the general knowledge is low. 
it's spotty. First of all, some communities are more informed than others. And you can't assume knowledge. And there is from general knowledge that is still satellite. And so the question is, yes, we should have consent. Yes, it's good documented. Yes, it's good to put it in the engagement letter. And then the question is, what do you actually put there? <laughs> And and so I think that goes back to this requirement for obvious and clear consent as well. So it's not necessarily going to be enough. And again, I, I don't want to sit here and pretend to prescribe what is or isn't going to unfold for consent use of AI specifically in legal practice, because I, I that that's getting figured out yet right across every sector. But if we look to what does it actually mean to have it in writing, let's say, or something like that, right? That lack of that lack of knowledge, right, creates a lot of opportunity for consent loopholes and things like that. So right now, in a lot of terms of engagement, there's things written about usage of client data, right, for various purposes, but it doesn't necessarily explicit explicitly say for the use of training, training AI models um, for use with other clients, for example, or something like this, right? And so the more explicit, and I think this is going to be coming, becoming much clearer in oncoming regulatory requirements, the more explicit, the better, of course, right? In terms of actually sharing the purpose, the purpose for data usage. So is that going to be used to train AI systems is going to be a very different question than just this blanket will be using your data and we have, have it for whatever miscellaneous purposes. And yeah, I think there's there's a lot of work to be done on actually defining what that means in terms of if we do go down that road where it's absolutely consensus absolutely required at any point in which we're using we're using AI in the legal context, uh, what does it actually mean? And is it enough just to notify the client um, and disclose usage? Or um, does there have to be that higher bar? Yeah. Now, that's where the interesting conversations are. And, and remember, depending on the tool you use, as soon as you put your client's information in it, that is confidential information that does not belong to you. And I think this is this point, that's why this conversation is so relevant. If you're putting anything that is client information in the chat GPT, you are sharing <laughs> that information and that well, could, and it can leak, right? Um, that, well, that could be leaked, but that act yeah. alone, you already before, even if it doesn't leak, right? So there's a, that, that's definitely could happen and you definitely have a hook for that. But the act of actually putting it there already triggers your ABA duties as a lawyer, which is different than privacy stuff. And, and there is this sort of timing properness requirement when it comes to communication. Uh, rule 1.4 is pretty clear about lawyer shall or has an obligation to promptly inform as opposed to post facto inform. So there, there is the substance and the timing element. And I, I do think that treating it as a moving target is an important way to take the look because your practices today may change over time. You may need to disclose a little more today when the general knowledge is not settled. How much more and how much of it belongs in the engagement letter versus addendum to the engagement letter versus the conversation. I think that's this is where <laughs> we had a lot of opinions in, in the room, as I think it's fair to say, as many opinions as you had, we had lawyers. And, and, it, and then that's where that conversation becomes very difficult. So there is a general convergence that it should be an engagement letter. And I guess the last issue before we wind down, because we could talk about it for a very long time, is concern about a decision to not use AI. And let me mm -hmm. treat it a, a little bit, because this is another thing that I think we're talking about and maybe less intuitive. Um, as an example, I'm going to use rule 1.5, talks about fees and the obligation that those fees are reasonable. What reasonable in the context of, of our fees is a whole different segment I'm not going to be covering here, but provided to say that if you use technology, there is a really good chance you can lower costs and streamline and maybe even get effective outcomes or not. In decision to use technology, the actual effect, the reasonableness of fees. So the question 
that we eventually got to, do you need to get consent for not using AI, especially in the context of your reasonable fees obligation? And that may be less of an issue today when the, the technology is nascent, but it may become increasingly an issue. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, Elaine. But actually, it makes me think of this article I was re- reading recently about the Avianca versus Matakis, where there's this question about competence, right? There was this argument being surfaced that the reason that it, that the, the legal professionals, and I, I believe it was regarding this case, there's been other similar cases since, but that the reason that the law firm and lawyer decided to use the AI system in, in the first place was because there was a lack of adequate legal training on that specific topic domain. and so. There's this question of the fiduciary duty for competence as well. And how does it conflict with that? Because on the one hand, you do have AI tools and technologies, research databases, for example, right, that are incredibly tuned and fine-tuned um, to a particular use case, right? And so there becomes this question then that if we're saying consent to not use, then that almost ends up conflicting with other duties, right? Where there is a duty to actually use the best tools at your disposal to achieve the best outcome for your client. And so what's that kind of, that tension? How does that tension get resolved? Because it's not so one-sided. Exactly. And specifically, is this one thing that is meant to like in a third of the ABA model rules, because pretty much you cure every problem with consent. One way or another, it comes up in uh, property of a client, specifically data. It comes up in informational kind of stuff that needs to be disclosed to make good decisions promptly. It comes up in, in one third or one quarter of the model rules. So the consent is a big thing. And com- disclosure to make an informed decision about uh, using technology and not using is a flip side of it becomes very difficult, especially as the general knowledge of this technology is still developing. And so what we do find in our conversation with, uh, as we were drafting the MIT principles that are now widely debated, and uh, the, we have asked folks to share their views, is that's exactly what happens, especially with consent. All these other ethical duties that had mentioned in the beginning of this episode, um, they come up. Because they're highly intertwined, it's very hard to separate the consent from confidentiality or consent from property of the client. Because a lot of things are are cured with consent and it's mentioned, it's defined specifically, and it's mentioned a bunch of times uh, throughout the model rules. So it is definitely an anchoring sort of way that the model rules are designed around. Coming to the end. I do, maybe I'll ask, I want to talk a little bit about tools that maybe you're not building, maybe you're just using, and they're somehow just using principles of privacy and security designed with sense in mind. And suppose you put it in and it doesn't go anywhere, then destroyed, it's not retained, right? So you're a lawyer, you listen to the lawyer, you're using some proprietary tool. You put stuff in it and it doesn't get bad or leak. It's evaporates. Mm. Whatever that means in the context of technology, I'm not even sure if it's possible. But let's just yeah, say <laughs> it, it, it evaporates. Does that change your duty to disclose? The, 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 let's just say the, the Houdini act that I just described. <laughs> but actually, it does exist. At first, I was like struggling. Oh dear, what am I going to even... I have no idea what she's referring to, but yes, there is actually a lot of work being done in regards to how do we share data without necessarily like sharing the personalized information, for example. And there's a lot of work being done. If you look at, there's like data trust models you might've heard of, which are like third party, basically like data brokers and federated learning models, for example, where we talk about, and these are actually be like in practice right now in the healthcare system quite a bit. And there's a lot of translation in terms of how they could be applied within the legal domain too, uh, where there's this, it's called federated learning. And it's basically this idea that the data sits within a protected, closed off walled database. It doesn't leave ever, it never leaves the system, but the machine learning model can still access that data from like a tokenized standpoint. 
So it's not, it's not the data itself, but a tokenized version of the data so that it can still be trained. It can still be trained without actually accessing or moving the data between systems. And yeah, there's a ton of work being done in that Houdini Act. <laughs> solving the world's problems, Olga. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's a lot of translation within the legal domain that can happen for sure. Yeah. That's why the technical components are so important, right? It's almost impossible to talk about consent without situating in general knowledge and without situating in how this technology works. One of the things we could talk about is how much a lawyer needs to know before we lawyer explain this to the client, uh, which is in itself a big subject. But I think we've kind of got a lot of ground. There's most definitely a disclosure requirement. There's a timing and substance element that needs to happen. Engagement letter is a good vehicle for that. How much of stuff you put in, how much of stuff you discuss is left to your judgment as always. The best practices are TBD. They are it's a, what, what I would call an active volcano. It's still developing. And the landscape may or may not include high hills after that. So it's very important to keep your hand on the pulse because the general knowledge is just not settled yet. And you may have to explain quite a lot. Be very conscious when you take somebody's stuff, your client's stuff, and you put it somewhere because that in itself a, a disclosure of confidential information independent of whether or not it's available publicly and you must take care of it. And so mm -hmm. it's important to think through those issues. And then there's a number of wrinkles. If you have technology that doesn't, you may think about it differently in the future. And if you um, have opportunity to somehow contain costs of your legal representation and make them quote unquote more reasonable, you might have additional duties. Some things to think about because consent is throughout the model rules. It is the, the limpin of the whole thing. And so that's why there's a lot of conversations and debate. What is consent? How much of a consent you need to consent? How much of it should be in writing and all of that stuff. Elaine, we've come to the end. Would love for you to maybe, with that summary of where we'll be and how folks should start thinking about it. And yes, do read the model rules. They are still very much a place to start and, and anchor your actions as a lawyer. Do you have the one or two takeaways that folks should think about as they go on the journey of this really powerful nascent technology and want to do the right thing here and live up to the obligations? Yeah, I would say definitely keep on top of trends in data protection law because it's much more mature than, than regulation speaking specifically to the use and management of AI. So keeping on top of those and where they're headed because they're informing a lot of the direction of this next generation of requirements coming down, coming down the pipe. And I would say also keeping on top of um, multi-stakeholder conversations. So not sticking within this legal domain specifically and branching out into those more technical communities and other spaces where these conversations are happening, but from a different angle, because it's not enough to just look at this question from that one siloed point of view and like how things have been done traditionally, because we are fundamentally talking about a completely different thing and in a completely new space that is going to require new operating models. I love that. And with that in mind, that law should not be silos and work with technology, especially when we talk about technology. Let's felt like oh, it. Make what I thought. What I thought. Definitely do that. And thank you so much. I, I, I enjoy our conversation. I really, I, I, everyone knows I love lawyers, but I really have a soft spot for folks who are not lawyers who love law. <laughs> and lawyers, they are very special people. Um, and the world should cherish them and, and uh, include them in every conversation. Thank you so much. I'm really excited uh, that we had this conversation. And thank you. To thank, thank you for having me here. All right. Bye, everyone. And that brings us to the end of another thrilling episode on the Notes to My Legal Self AI Insights. We had a fantastic time exploring the fascinating intersection of law and AI with you. But hold on tight because the adventure doesn't stop here. Stay connected with us on social media to continue the conversation share your thoughts, and be part of our incredible community of legal enthusiasts. Together, we can inspire, learn, and make a real impact on the world of law and AI.
If you enjoyed today's episode, we encourage you to share it with your friends, colleagues, and anyone else who could benefit from the exciting insights we discussed. Let's spread the knowledge and enthusiasm far and wide.